All right, so what we're going to do here in this first section of notes is we're going to look at intermolecular forces. Now, intermolecular forces is a mouthful, so sometimes we abbreviate that as IMF, but that's what we're talking about, intermolecular forces. This is basically um, going to explain how molecules interact with each other, um, what determines whether substance is a solid, liquid, or a gas, what determines whether substance is a high or low melting point or boiling point. Lots and lots of properties uh, and interactions are determined by these intermolecular forces. So before we get into the actual intermolecular forces, let's just uh, get two terms straight, intra and inter. Intramolecular forces are otherwise known as bonds. So if we look at this image here, the intra inside an actual molecule are these guys, and we know these as bonds. These happen to be covalent bonds because we have a nonmetal and another nonmetal all bonded together. So these are covalent bonds here, um, and you also know obviously ionic bonds. And then inter is between. So intra is within, inter is between. So this molecule is interacting with this molecule, which is interacting with this molecule, and so forth. So the interactions between molecules that neighbor each other are called intermolecular forces. So that's what we're going to focus on here. We spent the last two units talking about intra. Now we're going to focus on between neighboring molecules, not what's actually inside a molecule itself. However, your understanding of the bonding, especially polarity, is really important in understanding how they interact with each other. Now, something you should know, we've got ionic, which are the strongest types of bonds. Ionic are strong. We've got covalent, which are uh, not as strong as ionic, but they still hold molecules together. And then we've got intermolecular attractions, which are weaker than both ionic and covalent. So these intermolecular attractions, um, you can kind of think of them as bonds, but they're certainly not as strong as ionic or covalent. They are responsible for uh, lots of properties, and like I mentioned before, it'll tell us whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. Um, it'll give us information about boiling point and melting point and all that fun stuff. So real quick, strong forces over here between these two oxygens, same thing here, stronger covalent bond, compared to the very weak force uh, between these two molecules here. But this force does exist, and because this is a weak force, it makes oxygen a gas at room temp. If this force was a little bit stronger between these two, it would make it a liquid, and if it was even stronger, it'll make it a solid, which we'll see in a minute. All right, so there's three categories of intermolecular forces. There's London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonding, which is actually a type of dipole interactions. Um, we're gonna first talk about London dispersion forces, and then we'll go into detail about the other two. Now take a look at the animation here. These are uh, two neon atoms, and notice that as they move, their electrons, the blue dots within the orange atom, the electrons are shifting around, and they seem to be shifting so that they end up on the bottom of each, the bottom left hand -hand side, of each one of these atoms. So the thing to remember here is that these uh, London dispersion forces, and sometimes they're just called dispersion forces, um, sometimes people throw on the word London before it uh, and give the guy who worked with this credit. But either way, London dispersion or dispersion forces, they're the weakest of all, and they're caused by the motion of electrons, which you see here. And just this random motion of electrons, they happen to be moving to one side and making one side more negative than the other. It's not a permanent thing like we saw with polarity. A molecule is polar or it's nonpolar. Um, and that's a permanent thing. This is just a temporary motion of electrons, and they, if they happen to end up on one side, it makes one side negative. And if they happen to be moving to this one side, well, they might influence the electrons over here and force those electrons away, because remember, electrons repel each other. So these forces are due to uh, the electrons moving around within that electron cloud, and one, or the movement of electrons in one might influence the movement of electrons in the other and start to cause these temporary attractions. So they occur in all molecules, doesn't matter what kind. The electrons move around through the electron cloud. Now we know this, they move around and we typically draw them like this nice, perfectly spherical uh, shape here. But we know that the electrons do shift randomly back and forth. 
And we see on this side of the molecule, the electrons are over here more than they're on this side. So this side would get a slightly negative charge, and this side would get a slightly positive charge. And over here, they're doing the same thing. And these negatives are attracted to this positive side, and so forth. So we can see that if these electrons do just happen to shift one way or the other, they're going to start influencing each other. And then all of a sudden, this force in between, this positive and negative, this small temporary attraction, uh, again, will influence how they behave. So this is called, that small attraction, due to the uh, motion of the electrons, is called the London dispersion forces. You can think of the electrons just kind of dispersing themselves around the electron cloud, and if they end up on one side, they give it a small little charge. So it's not a permanent partial charge, that's really important. Over here we see an even distribution, the way the artist draw, drew it here, an even distribution of electrons, but if the electrons just happen to move to one side or the other, over here uh, there's more electrons than on the other side, so it gets a negative charge, which will be attracted to the other side positive charge. So it's a temporary uneven distribution. So that's London dispersion forces. And another thing you should know that the more electrons there are in a cloud, the stronger that temporary charge is, the more they're going to shift, and the bigger that charge is. So therefore, the stronger the dispersion force, or the attraction between oppositely charged sides. And as a result, we're going to end up with different properties. So look at this. We've got a small molecule, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. As we get bigger, there's more electrons. There's a stronger charge when those electrons do move from side to side. There's a stronger force, and that causes different properties. Look at what happens to the the uh, boiling point here. This methane, the stuff in our gas jets, boils at a, a negative 161.5 degrees. So it's already a gas here at room temp. It boiled way below this room temp. But as we get bigger, it needs more energy to boil. And here's n-butane uh, boiling almost at 1 degree Celsius, uh, or 0 degree Celsius rather, as opposed to negative 161 degrees Celsius. And another uh, way we could look at this is surface area. The more surface area, um, these guys have more surface area. They're longer than these guys. So these are guys are going to have different properties, um, different dispersion forces, because the electrons can be shifted even more over here than over here. So this one, uh, its boiling point is 36 degrees. Over here, it's only 9.5 degrees. So because these have stronger properties, or stronger uh, dispersion forces, you have to add a lot more energy to get them to boil. So, in a nutshell, the electrons shift. The more electrons you have shifting, the bigger the charge, the stronger the dispersion forces, and that'll influence properties. And you can see that from this graph. Take a look at uh, the graph here for the halogens. These are group 7 elements. So if you look at group 7 on the periodic table, we've got fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Now these guys, remember they're all diatomic, so it's F2, Cl2, and so forth. These guys here, uh, as they get bigger, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, more electrons here, fewer electrons here. As they get bigger, they have uh, stronger and stronger forces. So few electrons, weak forces, gases. Not very strongly held together. But if you have more electrons, stronger dispersion forces, now it's a little bit tighter, it's a little harder to escape and turn into gas. And then even more electrons, iodine. Remember you played with iodine in the zinc iodide lab? The little iodine crystals, those were solids. They have the strongest dispersion forces. Because there's so many electrons, they shift and shift and shift, and they make really strong forces. So they're solids, because they're strong attractions at room temp. So the number of electrons you have determines the forces, and then the strength of the forces determines states of matter, and properties such as boiling point melting point. Notice that they both go up over time here, or uh, with increase in mass. And again, same thing here. Here's group eight elements. Noble gases, notice that the bigger they get, the higher their boiling point. The stronger the forces, stronger the dispersion forces. The more they move, the stronger that force. All right, we'll pick up with the next video with dipole-dipoles.